So, you know, when I browse all of these different videos, clips, I mean, I see Right Wing Watch likes to post these clips of hate preachers exposing them for what they say and what they do. Various articles, you know, all these links that appear on social media. And of course, Hemet Meta, friend, fellow heathen, brother, infidel, who has posted a lot of these hate preachers. And I wanted to talk to Hemet today. I'm going to play you some clips of some of these just, you know, it's funny. When I talk to mainstream Christians, Hemet, you know, they're like, well, my God is love. Nobody preaches yeah. this stuff behind the pulpit anymore. And you would beg to differ, would you not? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say two things to that. One is that the argument a lot of atheists have been making is no, it is not a God of love. And certainly it's not a God of only love. And while these particular preachers do say a lot of horrible things, which I know we're going to talk about, a lot of mainstream evangelical uh, preachers say many of the same things, but they know how to say it in better language and with better rhetoric. So it doesn't have the sting that some of these other guys are using. I hear a lot of, you know, hate the sin, love the sinner, that kind of condescension that comes down. Yeah. But I mean, some of these guys are drawing just chapter and verse right out of the Bible. And, um, I'm struck by how in the 21st century we're, we're dealing with this. I'm going to play you some clips here in just a second, clips that you posted. This is no surprise to Hemet, but that's why you're here. I want to comment on it. But first, I want to mm -hmm. talk about this other story. This just uh, hit a few days ago. Alyssa Shepard, Fulton County, Indiana. This uh, woman was involved in a terrible accident because of her neglect. People died. And then she just got, a, would we call it leniency by the prison system? Can you flesh that story out to start us off? Yeah. Yeah. She was, she ran through a school bus stop sign on a really bad intersection, which I think they've since changed. But she basically ran her car into four kids. Three of them died. One kid was seriously injured. And for her, she was charged with, I think, reckless driving or, or something like that. And she was given a sentence that amounted to 10 years, but four of them were behind bars. Three were at home, but you can't leave your house. And three were on probation, which, I mean, we can have arguments about whether that's the right sentence or not, but that was what she was assigned. And what happened recently is she got let out of the first phase of that sentence, that behind bars part of it. She was let out six months early. And why? I mean, prisoners do get out early if they're, you know, model prisoners, so to speak. But she was this is not that she was let out early because she took a Bible class in prison and the nature of the Bible class. We don't know anything about. We just know they offered it. She took it. And because she took that Bible proselytizing course, she was allowed to get out of jail six months earlier. The family of the victims, by the way, that was one family. All three of those kids who died, one family, the, the family is not happy, obviously, with uh, the fact that a Bible course was allowed to make her sentence more lenient. They don't understand it. And the state of Indiana has not really elaborated on it. But um, it, it the questions that came to my mind afterwards is, well, what if you're not Christian? What if you are any other religion or non-religious? What are the alternatives for you? Are there courses you could take that would allow you to get out of jail as early or drop your sentence that much? And as far as I can tell, the answer is there are no alternatives to that course. I don't know that for a fact, but I mean, it just shows you how Christian privilege kind of seeps into all these areas of our life. You know, I, I have no problem with, I mean, I get someone was... I mean, it was horrible. It was neglectful. She has, to my understanding, expressed no remorse. I mean, it's to the hugely... family specifically, no remorse. And I, I think the reason her sentence was seen by a lot of people as light to begin with is because she had no prior convictions. She, this was a horrible accident. I get it. And by and large, I think everyone agrees with that. Stupid, reckless, but an accident. 
But if um, she had been involved yeah. in like Quranic studies instead of a Christian faith exercise, right? That's the question, right? Yeah. Like what would have happened if that were the case? And I don't have a solid answer for that, but I do know that on the Indiana Department of Correction website, they did say you can take a Bible study and it would help you. I mean, it's good that they offer courses for a lot of things to help prisoners who are expected to be released in the future. I like that. We should have more of that. And I don't even mind if, you know, religious education is a part of that for the people who want it. But to suggest, and this is my takeaway from it, to suggest that only the Bible is going to make you a better person and not, I, it's not like they were advertising the Quran course or, you know, an astronomy course or whatever on the site. I, that raises some ethical, legal questions that, you know, well, as we uh, may want to look into. Get into some of the clips they have. from Bible believers. We can effectively argue the Bible does not necessarily make you a better person. You've been following this story about Michael Flynn. The only reason I bring him up is because he just rewrote the Constitution. <laughs> For those who don't know <laughs> yes. who Michael Flynn is, he's a piece of work. He was National Security Advisor under Trump for what, like three weeks? It's the shortest like term of any National Security Advisor. And then yeah. turns out he's like- A couple of Scaramucci's there. He's, he's uh, liaising with uh, Russia and then he lies to the FBI and he makes some kind of deal. And he ne did he ever do any prison time? I can't remember if he actually went to prison. Uh, he, was, he was convicted. He was pardoned by Trump, right? As uh, right before Trump left office, I believe. Well, but he, he was pardoned. He came forward. And I've got the clip right here. Let me just play it. He came forward and said this- about the United States Constitution. Democracy is always a fragile type. But we have this, this thing, this Constitution that we embrace. And I always like to say that, that our Bill of Rights, because our, our founders did this, and if you read their diaries, you read the Federalist Papers, you read their writings, because this is all about the people that we're talking about tonight running for office and others that are out there. You read all these things, you study the history of this country, you study how it was founded. That's why, they, that's why the word creator is in the Constitution four times. Right? We, are, we are endowed by our creator. The Bill of Rights. When you look at the Bill of Rights, I want you, next time you look at the Bill of Rights, in fact, tonight when you go home, look at the Bill of Rights and lay the Ten Commandments right down next to them. Okay? Put them right next to each other. And you'll get a sense of how they developed the Bill of Rights. Hammett, I, you know, I didn't know those things were in the Constitution. And this was an education for yeah. me, you know, really. It was an education for a, it was an education for a lot of people, I think, uh, because the word creator does not appear in the Constitution. I assume, as many did, he was referring to the Declaration of Independence, which says we are all endowed by our creator, these, you know, unalienable rights. But even then, he said it was four times in there. It's not, uh, unless you want to count like the year of our Lord, something like that. And even so, the Declaration of Independence does not govern the laws, does not set the basis for the laws of our country. So whatever he was trying to get at, which is that we live in some Christian nation because he was at a campaign rally campaigning for another right-wing conservative Christian running for U.S. Senate— I mean, the argument that he's trying to make using the evidence he was offering does not make any sense. Well, and the problem is, is we're not talking about a fact-checking culture, right? So, I mean, if he says it, everybody yeah. just nods and smiles. And, you know, right. we're seeing this war on our fellow human beings by the Christian nationalists, by Bible fundamentalists. Uh, Republican lawmakers are uh, in Idaho are pushing this uh, Senate Bill 1309. As soon as a fetal heartbeat is detected, uh, before even some women even know they're pregnant, right? Uh, it would become right. illegal to uh, have an abortion. And there was a Satanist, uh, a, non, yeah. a non theistic Satanist, who went and spoke to that panel regarding that Senate bill. You followed that story, right? Yeah, and the, what the Satanist was trying to do is during a public comment section, I believe the bill had passed the House. It was waiting for a vote in the Senate. This was a committee hearing. And the Satanist, who goes by uh, they pronouns, 
they they gave a speech. They gave their two minute speech, which they were allowed to do, and basically made a couple arguments. One, this bill is unethical. But two, don't you all care about religious freedom? Because as a Satanist, I believe my body cannot be violated, and this bill would violate my body by, you know, in effect, forcing me to go through a pregnancy if that were to happen. Um, okay, well, thinking, hang on. Let me jump in, Hemet, real fast. Let me play yeah. that because I've got video here. Let me sure. play that clip so people can see exactly what happened. It does run a little under two minutes. Uh, hello, my name is Amber Ola. I'm here to testify against Senate Bill 1309. Uh, I live in Boise, Idaho, and this is important to me because bodily autonomy is a value that I hold very dearly. Uh, it is also worth mentioning that Idaho has free exercise of religion protected. And I do identify as a non-theistic Satanist. So this bill would be uh, counter to my deeply held religious beliefs. I am a member of the Satanic Temple Idaho. Uh, you can find more information about our religion on our website and in regards to our tenants and how this directly impacts our membership. So I wanted to go ahead and remind the legislation that that is something at play. Um, also, I believe that this is vehemently against medical care because uh, quite frankly, I don't believe any of you are medical professionals uh, to tell me what I can and cannot do with my own body. Um, so, yeah, I will go ahead and end my testimony there and stand for any questions. Thank you, Amber. Other questions? Representative Scott. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman and Amber. So mm -hmm. as a Satanist, do you um, think murder is okay? I do not believe murder is okay. It is actually a, a value of ours to hold compassion and empathy for all creatures in accordance with reason. So, no, we do not believe murder is okay. 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 Follow up. Thank you. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Amber. Do you realize that this bill does allow for the bur the murder of some babies, um, for rape and incest babies, and it doesn't matter if they have a heartbeat. Do you realize that? Um, I'm aware uh, that there are exceptions in the legislation regarding that. I believe, however, it is still uh, a against my right of bodily autonomy, as stated in the third tenet of my religion, which is one's body is subject to one's will alone. Uh, actually, uh, the exact wording is one's body is inviolable, subject to one's will alone. So that is the precedent. Thank you. Any further questions? Representative Barbieri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I think you, I've got some uh, preconceived ideas about your religion. For I'm sure. wondering, uh, is there any tenet with respect to blood sacrifice? No. Uh, Mr. Barbieri, let's make sure we keep it to the um, well, narrow focus of the bill. And it's her, relig uh, her religion's not on trial here today. What I'm curious about is whether or not there is a, a tenet with respect to the human sacrifice. Find a way to tie it back to the bill. Can't do that. Okay. Well, let's keep it to the bill. We've got to maintain order and decorum. Well, I can't get over it's the guy on the panel who said something about, yeah. uh, do you hold to blood sacrifice? Like, what, uh, the Satanists are sacrificing right. fetuses to the Dark Lord kind of thing? Uh, yeah. In in that clip, you hear two state senators, who bo one of whom... Uh, says, well, like basically implying, well, you're a Satanist, so you must be cool with murder, right? Because abortion is murder. And that's one thing. That's bad enough. But then one of her uh, colleagues speaks up and basically is like, I don't care what you had to say. I just heard the word Satan, so I'm just going to run with it and starts making some bizarre accusations about what Satanists believe, none of which are accurate, at least in terms of what the speaker believes. Um, and even the Republican head of that committee had to step in, and you heard in the clip, say to that person, like, dude, stick to the topic. This is not a time to have some <laughs> religious debate here. May I think he even said in that clip, like, can your question be relevant to what the person said? And he's like, I can't do it. Some version of that. It's like... You're giving it away. You don't actually care to be here. Why are you doing this? <laughs> I'm amazed at how people who are supposedly divinely protected are always freaking out about evil. You've been, I know Greg yeah. Locke, Tennessee <laughs> pastor Greg Locke is uh, somebody that you follow. And I've talked about him from time to time. This is what Pastor Greg Locke said 
from the podium to his congregation. We got first and last names of six witches that are in our church. And you know what's strange? Three of you are in this room right now. Three of you in the room right now. You better look in my eyeballs. We ain't afraid of you, you stinking witch. You devil worshiping Satanist witch. We cast you out in the name of Jesus Christ. We break your spells. We break your curse. We got your first name. We got your last name. We even got an address for one of you. You so much as cough wrong and I'll expose you in front of everybody in this tent, you stinking witch. You were sent to this church to destroy us. You were sent to this church to lure us in. You were sent to this church to cast spell. Listen, some of you been sick because you befriended that witch. Two of you in my wife's ladies Bible study and you know who you are and we gonna ask you to get out or I'll expose you in front of everybody. Uh, the witches, they're, uh, I get, he treats them like moles, like they're spies, you know, <laughs> who've infiltrated. Yeah. At the time of this conversation, he actually did name two people, and then they responded. Here's a clip. Sometimes you got to let people reveal themselves for who they are. If you have ever publicly, privately, in their house, in this church, I don't care where, if you have ever been prayed over, had hands laid on you by Brian and Gina Warren, you are under a curse of witchcraft. I'm going to go back on 11 14 of 2021. They came over to our home. Hence, we have the witch's address. We know your address and your little dog too. So all of those listening I'm the quote unquote witch and he's the male warlock. There's two of them he's called out. I guess he's an MMA warlock. So it's the Warrens versus the warlocks. So we prayed. They heard me in the privacy of my own home, praying in tongues over them. I wasn't chanting. They received all of it. So what I did before they had gotten here is I took a piece of paper and I'm going to, I think I'm going to go ahead and do it right now, even though it's in the video. Here's the jar. I, so let's go ahead and open the jar and they, we got four of them. I went to Walmart that day when I knew they were coming and I got four little glass jars and I put a piece of paper in it. And what it says is Judges 720, 11, 14, 2021, Gina Guy Warren, Truth and Love Ministries. And it's the scripture. There you go. There's the witch's covenant, everybody. Do you understand how do you understand how reckless this is? See, the point you're trying to make, that did sound like a threat. And the threat is that it's not really about Satan or the devil or witches. It's saying, if you cross me, if you get in my way, I'm going to make your life a living hell because I'm the one in the pulpit and you're the one out there. So the message was really not about the witches. The message is don't get in my way. I'm going to come after you and publicly shame you if you cross me. And that, to me, is the more frightening thing about that story. Because I mean, but... anybody anybody could be a witch. Anyone. I think he even said later, like, well, a couple of them were men. Like, it could be anyone in his congregation who dares to challenge him. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I will. Aren't there allegations of like domestic abuse with this guy? I mean, doesn't he have a checkered past, some real red flags that we should be aware it's, of? It's questionable. And I say that for a reason. There was one article about his ex-wife that came out a few years ago that made a lot of suggestions about, at the very least, emotional abuse. However, and this is where, where why I'm kind of hedging here, um, all of those things were posted by a conservative Christian website whose journalistic credibility I don't quite take for granted. You know what I mean? Uh, I get that. And well, I so mean, I don't want to be part of perpetrating uh, something that's right. totally unsubstantiated just because I, I despise think, the man. You know, I do think it's worth bringing up because I do hear this allegation come up every now and then. But I think this is what's important to realize. There's no lawsuit, no a uh, criminal allegation against the guy. It's a lot of hearsay, and I don't trust the source. And so that's kind of what people should go in. But what I have seen and what is proven is that these clips that, that you shared, 
many of them that come from his sermons on a regular basis are easily uh, portrayed. I mean, I, I think you could easily say it's an emotional manipulation. It's, you know, religious uh, abuse in a way, because he's basically saying, you got to be with my church and my way of thinking, or I'm going to cast you as the enemy. And I'm going to make sure, very cult-like here, I'm going to make sure everyone in this congregation shuns you if you cross my path. We got some people under this tent right now. You have the hardest time keeping your mouth shut about your church. So I'm going to sit here for about 15 seconds and just give you a chance to leave anytime you want to. Because we need your seat anyhow, you complaining, judgmental Pharisee. You can leave anytime you want to. I'm just going to sit here for a minute and let you walk out. If you can call me out behind closed doors, why don't you be man enough, put on your big boy pants, stand up and walk out right now for everybody, you coward. You critical hypocrite, you Pharisee. If you think I'm going to stop just because you want me to, you have lost your mind. I'm just getting started good. I worry a lot about his ilk of pastor really calling people, I mean, to physical violence, right? Christian jihad. I mean, this to, to hear, I mean, I don't, it, this sounds funny when I say it, but the violence in his language. I mean, he's very much a fight, fight, fight. I'm in your face. We're not going to yeah. take it. Go get him. Don't you dare, you know? And uh, I know that there's a culture of people that responds to that tone that I think would, could be easily sort of nudged into a physical attack against what they consider to be the infidel, right? Yeah, this is what's scary to me about preachers like him and a lot of those new independent fundamentalist Baptist preachers, which Greg Locke is not, but they're, they're kind of in that same mold, which is I don't think Greg Locke is the sort of person who would commit an act of violence like the kind you're talking about. I don't think so. However, I could not say the same about the people who attend those churches. It's a very Trumpian sort of thing here. Did the guy at the top commit the crime? Maybe, maybe not. But he sure as hell knows how to whip his followers into a frenzy, so maybe they'll do some of it and take the fall if anything happens. I'm just now calling out Joe Biden. I'm just now preaching against the LGBTQ community. I'm just now calling out abortion. I'm just now talking about election fraud. I'm just now talking about Antifa and Black Lives Matter. I'm just now calling out this wicked nonsense. I'm interested in the othering, the dehumanization Joe Jones, pastor of Shield of Faith Baptist Church in Boise, Idaho. Uh, he's been on the radar of organizations like the Anti-Defamation League and others. He condones the mistreatment of all non-heterosexuals. Here's a clip. I've read Genesis 19. You've read Genesis 19. We've read Judges 19. It is not very kind. It is not very sensitive. And it's not very compassionate to those people. Now it is to us, yeah, right? I think if God were to rain down fire and brimstone on all these queers, I, that's, that is kind, Amen. that is compassionate, Amen. right? That is a blessing to us Amen. because those people are monsters. This is what I think people don't really understand, which is there are dozens at least of these new independent fundamentalist Baptist churches. The way they preach is very fire and brimstone and the kind of thing you thought went out of style a long time ago. But the thing is, they are all about the Old Testament. They do not preach extensively about Jesus the way a lot of you know, evangelical preachers might. They talk very much about the rules and laws of the Old Testament as if they were not, you know, wiped clean by Jesus. And so the scary thing is guys like Joe Jones, guys like Jonathan Shelley, they really just spend so much of their time focusing on these laws that I think a lot of Christians would argue, well, they don't count anymore or whatever. They can rationalize them away. These guys focus on those laws. They preach sermons about those laws. They do not hold back in talking about it. And it's amazing how fast and how how fast these churches have blossomed how many of them there are if you did a uh, panoramic view of their audience they don't necessarily have big churches but the thing these pastors know better than most is that they're not playing to the crowd in the room they're playing to the crowd online where they can be radicalized like that pastor uh, jonathan shelley steadfast bible church hearst Texas. Terrifying clip. Let me play it for you. He's preaching this, 
And in the front five rows, sitting on the floor, young children. This is exactly what God wants in the New Testament. Did you realize that? Because you know what? Fornicators aren't welcome in the church. So if there's a whore, she's supposed to be thrown out until she repents and gets back in. And then on top of that, the sodomites never allowed in for any vow. Oh, I promise I'm saved. Nope, get away. I love the Lord. No, you don't. Get away from me. Love is love. No, there's no promise you could make. There's nothing you can say. You're never welcome. Go away. Amen. I just can't wait until you just go to hell. Right. Because there's no place for them. Shelley was just evicted, right? I mean, his landlord said, get the hell out of here. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and yeah, by the way, reason- I was exposing uh, some of his hate speech on Facebook, and then Facebook banned me. Guess what they banned me for, Emmett? Hate, speech. hate speech. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry for that, by the way. I posted oh, your this- tweet about it, and Facebook <laughs> gave me a 30-day strike. It is under review and probably will be till the day I die. But uh, I but he, but he was uh, he was evicted. Take uh, take me from that point, if you would. Yeah, you showed the clip where he's preaching with children in the front row. The reason they had all that space in the front row is because he got evicted and had to find a temporary residence somewhere else for his church. But yeah, basically, a lot of these churches they're not big enough to to command their own buildings. They don't have enough money to kind of create their own thing. They rent out like areas in strip malls and things like that to hold their church services, put up a little background behind you, get a little bit of lighting, and guess what? You're fit for YouTube, you know what I mean? It's going beyond just saying you do all this wicked stuff, it's saying you enjoy it. You enjoy murder. You enjoy malignity. You enjoy hating God. Look, there's only one group that enjoys that. It's the pride parades going up and down the street. And you know, it's great when trucks accidentally go through those, you know, parades. I think only one person died, so hopefully we can hope for more in the future. You say, well, that's mean. Yeah, but the the Bible says that they're worthy of death. You say, are you sad when f***s die? No, I think it's great. I hope they all die. I would love it if every f*** would die right now. And so Jonathan Shelley was doing that for several years. He said so many horrible, hateful, anti-gay things over the years that I guess after there were protests because he recently said something over the top, even for him, there were protests outside the entire strip mall against him. And I think the landlord was just fed up and had an out in their contract that said, you know, if you're preaching hate speech, uh, that's a legitimate legal ground for me to evict you from my property. And that's exactly what this landlord seems to have done. Literally, these disgusting, filthy will try to get people drunk so they can do weird things to them. And you don't even know. You don't even know if someone's like that because they all hide and they all, you know, deceive. And and because our world is just filled with so many metro, effeminate, queer-looking dudes, it's hard to even realize who's a f*** anymore. So he gets evicted, and all of a sudden you got all these backup pastors. I think one may have been in his own church. Uh, how is it legal even behind a pulpit, to call for the actual execution of gay people. They're predators. They're bullies. They're imposing their will on people. That's why God says just put them to death. Because they can't reason with them. They don't do anything good for society. They bring nothing to the table at all in our society. They're just criminals. They're pedophiles. And they're sick and disgusting. And anyone with a normal brain knows that they're sick and disgusting. Our country used to squash the sodomite problem like a bug. It's called the death penalty. It's called stone them with stones. It's called hang them. It's called firing squad. It's called, you know, they get ran over by a truck by another sodomite. I don't care how they die. If they're worthy of death, why would I care the method of which they die? Let me say two things. One is to answer your question, how is it legal? None of these pastors, I'm not trying to defend them, but here's the excuse they make. I am not calling for the execution of gay people. I am not telling anyone in this church to do that. I'm saying in an ideal biblical world, the government would make it a crime punishable by death. This is basically a perfect illustration of what happened to Pastor, you know, Pastor Shelley is steadfast, is that you know, these fags were basically, you know, he, they told them, you know, hey, you know, protest his church, and, and, and then he twisted his words and say that you know, he 
said that we should be killing fags or whatever. And, they, and they, he clearly said that it was, should be government sanctioned, that the government is their job. To that is their way of, you know, c- circling the square, however you want to say that. That's their defense here. But ultimately, they're saying it would be cool if we could do that. The government ought to do that. A lot of this really began with a guy named Steven Anderson in Arizona. And there are like literally dozens of these churches, mostly in the United States. But yeah, after Jonathan Shelley got evicted, they used that persecution claim as if you guys, they're all coming after us, too, because they hate the Bible, because they hate Christians. That's the rhetoric they're using to their congregations and their online audiences. By the way, Jonathan Shelley, I know he did a a sermon recently on, uh, he mentioned whores uh, in one of his sermons, but he's got this take on the the biblical woman, and I'm going somewhere with this, but as I'm Uh playing this litany of clips, I got to play the context Pastor Jonathan Shelley regarding the biblical woman. We see the Nancy Pelosi's of this world. We see the Kamala Harris's of this world. We see the work that they're doing. And that's why I reject women in any position of authority or leadership. You know, it makes me mad every time I drive up and down the street, there's this stupid billboard or this stupid little poster I see for like Pamela Boggess or something running for judge. And I'm thinking, what a curse unto our nation. She's a conservative. She's a Republican. Well, get in the kitchen and start making conservative sandwiches. <laughs> Where in the Bible did it say that, oh, here's the virtuous woman. She's the judge. No, her husband's in the gate. Her husband's the judge. Her husband's the ruler. Her- My first thought, obviously, is, all right, well, these are a bunch of, you know, whiny, bigoted, privileged white guys. Who are talking about all this stuff? How convenient, you know? God put us in charge, is what they're saying. But when you look at the transformed wife on Twitter, yeah. you realize it's not just a, a dude. Uh, by the way, if you want a horror show, it's uh, the Twitter handle is at Godly Womanhood. I'm just gonna throw it out. The transformed wife. Your thoughts, Hemet Meta. <laughs> I've been I've been a can I say fan? Um it's not bad. I've been following this person online for so many years because it's not just Twitter. She has a blog where she says this stuff. She has her YouTube channel where she says this stuff. She's a real human. She is not a troll or a parody no matter what you think. Uh, that's she, my like, next question, but I mean <laughs> she's not just looking for clicks. When she posts something that says building a marriage upon whether or not a husband meets the wife's emotional needs is why up to 80% of divorces are initiated by women. Her whole take is is that women need to only think about the man, subservient. They shouldn't go to college. They shouldn't get a job. They certainly shouldn't be in the pulpit. The transformed wife. Yeah, which is weird because she doesn't take the even though she probably believes the same stuff, she doesn't go down the anti-gay route, LGBTQ route like she does about women. Uh, But yeah, her whole shtick is let me tell you how to be a good Christian wife. And it's a very fundamentalist Christian brand of womanhood, which says if you are not a virgin, like there's something wrong with you, which says, uh, hey, ladies, if your husband wants sex, you must have it with him. I believe she once said don't worry, it won't take long. Oh my um, God. But like, yeah, this this is her whole thing. It's a woman ought to be submissive, obedient, a good housewife. There is nothing else you could possibly want out of life. And any deviation from that is awful. And obviously the question comes up, like if that's what you want in life, so be it. But what if your husband is abusive, physically abusive, emotionally abusive, and she very much is like, doesn't care, doesn't matter, especially if it's emotional abuse. She does not care. You stay in the marriage no matter what. And it's, it's just so harmful. It's so damning. And it's, she just goes, I mean, she believes this stuff. It's not an act uh, for her. She posted uh, a quote from a Christian apologist, evangelist, and dinosaur, John MacArthur. Hell, he's been around since I was in Christian radio 30 years ago. Uh, Mm -hmm. And a quote that said, women pastors and women preachers are the most obvious evidence of churches rebelling against the Bible. I mean, you got to give them credit, though. Instead of sort of, 
hand fashioning a cafeteria plan, happy, clappy, Jesus is love kind of religion. I mean, they're, I mean, they're quoting the Bible. I mean, I guess uh, credit's not the word, whatever. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like you do not uh, under any circumstances have to hand it to them. Um, yeah, they, they will quote whatever they want to quote from the Bible. And again, I'm not suggesting they have it right. And, you know, progressive Christians have it wrong or anything like that, but they very much care about certain passages over others. They do not care about the big picture. And more importantly, whether it's the transformed wife, Lori Alexander, or John MacArthur or John Piper or whichever of these fundy preachers you want to talk about, they do not care if anyone is hurt by their words, by their rhetoric, or by living the lifestyle that they are calling for. Because this is the thing we've seen in recent years, which is, like you said, guys like MacArthur have been around for decades and decades. What's relatively new is how many more women who grew up in those churches and who got married and lived their lives in accordance with what those people are preaching. They are now coming out and saying, I needed to get out. It was the right thing for me to leave that relationship or end that marriage. I am a better person today because of it. Let me tell you my story because it's harmful. I don't want other women going down the same path. And the thing that's surprising is not just how many of those stories there are. It's how little People like MacArthur or Lori Alexander, it's how little they care about any of that. Those stories do not exist in their bubble. Well, you know, the whole goddamn thing is just sexual shame targeted toward, yeah. mostly toward women. You know, I mean, if you can yeah. control someone's identity, their sexual identity, then you're in their rooms, their private spaces, their thoughts, their worth, their futures, their relationships. It's insidious, I right? If I can back up for a second, I think you said um, a little bit ago with some of those new IFB preachers that it was mo these cis white men. And I, I just want to clarify, they are not all white. In fact, a good chunk of them really do cater to a Hispanic audience, too, especially in Texas. And they I mean, all of them, almost all of them that can do it have Spanish services on weekends. And I don't know the language well, so I don't listen to those sermons as much. But I have to think they're saying many of the same things in another language. So, like, they're, they're slowly expanding who they're reaching. And the scary thing is no matter how often YouTube cuts them off, they will pop back up. That violates YouTube's terms of services. But, like, uh, they will pop back up under a new channel. And Steven Anderson, the ringleader of it all is so bad as a human, he has literally been banned from stepping foot in, I think, three dozen-ish countries. He cannot enter the countries. He's on their list. That's, that's well, I mean, good for them. Maybe we'll be yeah. next. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's obviously, amazing. there's somebody mashing in the comments section right now. Free speech. Hashtag free speech, right. right? We have to protect the worst speech in order. I mean, we don't want to just protect the speech we like. I understand right. that argument to a degree, but I'm not a free speech absolutist. I used to be back in the day, but now I really do think, you know, terms of service, you know, you are signing a contract, sometimes a legitimate, sometimes a, so a social contract. If you are full of venom and toxicity and hate. And I don't think we can say, well, it's all subjective. Like some people think it's love. I think we can call it what it is. You know, if yeah. Twitter bans Greg Locke, he's not a free speech martyr, right? Right. And that's the thing. If YouTube cuts off their channel, that is not a violation of free speech. You broke the rules of YouTube. If you're cut off from Twitter or you get evicted from the strip mall space you're renting, that has nothing to do with free speech. And here's the thing. This hurts those new IFB preachers more than anything else because YouTube has been their platform for them to spread their hate. They need YouTube. Sure, could they make their own website where they upload videos on their own and post it? Yeah, they could. And by the way, no one's saying they can't do it. They have that right to do it, but they don't want to. That's not what would make them, they wouldn't be happy knowing they have that outlet. What makes them happy is trolling other people or getting in front of new eyes on YouTube, hoping someone's going down the rabbit hole of this stuff and finding them. That is what they're counting on. And it's the argument I would make for why I don't think like Trump's social network 
will ever amount to anything because these people don't want to talk to each other. They're not interested in the followers who are already there. They're interested in reaching a new crowd that they could never get on their own. And for a long time, YouTube, especially YouTube, was helping them do it. And now they're, I mean, it's almost funny to watch how they kind of try to evade the system. I mean, Jonathan Shelley, a guy we talked about already, he does not have one YouTube channel. He has many, and he'll post the same sermon live on all of them. And if one goes down, he tells his little followers, I need you to start up a channel and start posting these on yours. And it's you're falling for the cult leader ultimately. So you they're know? just walking between the raindrops kind of thing. Well, but, but if I can camp out here for just a second, yeah. I'm going to get to a couple of really wackadoodle clips that you've posted. Yeah. Um, I mean, with Parler and some of these right-wing social media pods, I worry t I mean, not just that they want to troll the rest of us. Don't those function as a kind of subgroup where they can spin whatever wackadoodle conspiracies and hate, et cetera, unchecked or relatively unchecked? In other words, they'll never be challenged and they can just spin themselves into a lather. I mean, that's one of the purposes of sites like that, right? Yeah, it is. And it's but again, if you think about what their goal is and the reason these guys have the notoriety that they've come to have, it's because they are not satisfied with talking to the people they already have. Um, of course, they can always speak in an echo chamber, but no one's going to care if they're speaking in an echo chamber. The thing that gives them power is that they've used I, I want to use secular in big quote words. They've used secular uh, nonpartisan outlets to spread their hate speech and losing that channel. I mean, it would be great for everybody, but losing that channel is kind of their biggest fear because they are not interested in talking to each other. They're not interested in preaching the gospel every week to a small church of, you know, a small crowd. They're, they're, they don't care. All right. They are aiming for the wider audience and having to force them to move to rumble or gag uh what's the one gab or parlor or anything gag, like that. gag is probably <laughs> better gag, yeah <laughs> gag is probably, yeah uh, having to move to that stuff would cut them off from what they actually want to do now they have tried they have found ways of trying to spread their stuff to a wider audience they've tried to branch out into new ways of preaching that's less homophobic outright um, it just doesn't really seem to get anywhere with them. Um, it's only when they go over the top that people give them attention. And I realize I have a role to play in that in some capacity. But also I think more sunlight on who these people are. Put Christians on the defensive as to why, like, hey, what's up with this dude who's preaching the Bible? Make them have to defend these people. You know what I mean? Well, I think that's because, a, the next question, though, Hemet. I yeah. mean— I get the vibe. Some of them are kind of riding the coattails of larger channels, hoping that we'll give them some oxygen. And I go back and forth. Part of me's thinking, do I really want to give him attention? And the other part of right. me is like, he's got some shitty ideas and ideas have to earn respect. So let's highlight the bad ideas. Do you wrestle with that question? How much oxygen do I give awful people? Sometimes. I, I will tell you this. As, as someone who was for a long time an atheist activist in the sense that I wanted people to become an atheist. I honestly don't care about that so much anymore necessarily, but there's a couple ways you could do that. One is trying to make the uh, argument as to why atheism makes sense. This is the Richard Dawkins, God delusion sort of arguments. Here's why apologetics, uh, a Christian apologists are wrong. Here, are, here's the logical argument for atheism. You can do that. It'll reach some people. It, it definitely has, but there's another side of it, which is, let me show you what happens. Religion is not a virtue. Let me show you what people who you cannot doubt that they believe this stuff. Let me show you what they're doing with it. And obviously there are all no sh there's no shortage of Christians who are in the news for doing something awful. There's no shortage of Catholic priests or Mormon leaders who get exposed for, you know, abuse. And in the case of these guys, it's these are people who believe in a very fundamentalist interpretation of the Bible. I'm not saying all these other Christians accept that, but this guy really believes this stuff, and I'm putting that out there. And it's not because I think uh, people are suddenly going to be like, oh, I guess Christianity is wrong, 
but it will make them squirm a little bit if they're a believer. And by the way, sometimes it's just pointing out, look where this could lead you. I'm not, I mean, look, most Christians I, I personally know are awesome. They're fine. I yeah. don't care that they believe something I disagree with. But the thing is, this is don't make an argument that religion makes you a good person. Don't make the argument that if you just read the Bible, you would be a better person. Because here are some examples of people who are clearly like unequivocally horrible people. And I do think shining a spotlight on that. I mean, imagine what I think. Let me go with a more familiar one. Westboro Baptist Church, which was kind of the sort of people we are talking about here for such a long time. There's always an argument. Do you give them publicity every time they do a publicity stunt? Or do you just, you know, it's not a big church. Just let them do their thing and maybe they'll go away. They're not going to go away. And by highlighting how horrible they are and how horrible the things they say are, you actually kind of can shift it over to the point where, yeah, no one wants to be like them. So if you want to fight that, even if you're a Christian and you don't want to be associated with them, your job is to move in that direction. You know, it's funny. I'm going to camp out on something you said. I've got a couple of clips I'm just aching to play here. But you said you're not all that interested in making or someone whether or not someone's an atheist. And, you know, for someone who was host of The Friendly Atheist, and I don't even have that on your uh, – Super on screen. I think I've got the only <laughs> sky link and your, yeah, your tweet. If you go to friendlyatheist.com, it'll take you there too. Yeah. But I mean, I host The Thinking Atheist, which is right. an icon represent, representing reason over faith. But I feel you in some ways. You know, I've heard it. Well, you want to make everybody in the world an atheist. And I think, no, I want to encourage other people to carve their own path and do their own thinking. I think if they do that, and they are honest about the evidence, they're probably going to lean far away from superstitions. They may become atheists. But my goal is not to rubber stamp atheism on everybody. And I'm guessing that's where you're going with that. And if I can elaborate, mm -hmm. there's a perception among some atheists that, well, you know, atheist rational good, religious people stupid bad. And I, I just, right. it just makes my brain melt. I don't... Yeah. You know, one of my best friends in the world and next door neighbor is a worship pastor at a nearby church. Yeah. Okay. He is one of the best people I know. He's not, he's not the best because of what he believes. He's got a genuinely right. good, he offered to drive me to the airport to go to an atheist conference to speak. You know, he just, he just loves people, right? Yeah. He just accepts yeah. me for who I am. And so, you know, I, I feel you in the sense that I don't, my mission is not to convert or deconvert him. It's more about encouragement to be your own person in the hopes that rationality will prevail. I don't know. You take that where you want, brother. What yeah. do you think? Yeah, that's a lot of it. I'm not keeping a tally board somewhere if someone becomes an atheist because of anything I do. I'm glad you are. I mean, if that's the case, good. I congratulations give yourself a pat on the back you don't have to tell me about it i don't care if you can <laughs> if you, de you deconvert do it on your own time it's all well and good but i think i mean i have no problem with progressive religious people who are pushing for val who share my values who are pushing for those things into law do we have a disagreement about god yes we do we probably have a disagreement on lots of things but for me, the bigger picture is what are you doing with whatever your beliefs are? Hey, listen, we could have a different conversation about atheists who have gone in crazy directions, too. So being an atheist is not the end all be all of anything anymore. Um, but I hope if I can offer anything to people who end up reading my stuff or watching anything I do, it's I would hope religious people are watching it, understanding where I'm coming from on it and agreeing with me on how horrible some of this stuff is. And I, I say the same thing about the, be us. the 21st century <laughs> Republican Party, you know, who are aghast about the insurrection and the, they're against Christian nationalism. There's a few, you know, Kristen Dumay wrote the book, Jesus and John Wayne, and we've got, uh, you know, Christians against Christian nationalism. Yes. They've got the website and they've concentrated efforts. And I think those sort of, uh, for lack of a better word, interfaith efforts are critical if we're going to change yes. the culture, right? Yeah. You but, need more of that. You need it. And I mean, Kristen Dumay's book is fantastic. Uh, Adam Kinzinger is from Illinois, the, the House member. He's been a very 
relatively progressive Republican on the Trump stuff, wrong about a bunch of other things. But I'm saying those voices matter and it helps when they're not the only people doing it. And so as long as there is a space to be created where those voices, someone who is a progressive Christian who calls out the toxic masculinity within church circles and the abuse and the spiritual manipulation, when you have religious people saying that, calling it out, we need to help them out. We need to be on their side for those things and not just say, well, they're Christians, so they're ultimately wrong about this, or they're Republicans, so they're ultimately wrong about this, or whatever it is. Like, no, you got to, good, you you got to one right place. Good for you. Keep going. Well, if you'll forgive my extremely awkward and um, perhaps clumsy segue, I wonder how those progressive Christians would approach someone like a, a guy that you post. I see a clip about every three or four days, and they're just awesome. Robin Bullock, the pastor <laughs> with the long hair, looks like an 80s yeah. hair band. Yeah, Silly Ray Cyrus. Church International, and that's kind of a generic name, but that's the name of his church. Church yeah. International. And he's got a new jam every five minutes. I mean, just untethered to reality. But let me play you a clip. This is his explanation for Noah's Ark. How a 500-year-old dude could single-handedly build a stadium-sized boat out of trees. Check it out. And you have to ask yourself this. How did he move those timbers around? Yeah. How did he pick up those timbers and Massive. move them around? Well, there's something called, you know, everything has a frequency. Yeah. This, this uh, AirPod case has a frequency. If you could, because it's made of matter, right. if you could match the frequency of this AirPod case and you knew what it was and you could match it, you could pick it up off the ground without touching it just through wow. sound. It had to be moved with sound. Well, that's brilliance of mind mm. that we don't possess right now. We uh, see all the technology just actually showed how dumb man has become <laughs> yeah. in comparison to how smart Noah and Adam and all of them were. Hammett, yeah, you followed this guy. Like, is he real? Unfortunately. Is he, I mean, is he just checked out of the hotel reality and I, you post him for amusement? You know, what's going this on is, there? So Robin Bullock is more of a guy. Uh, right Wing Watch has kept tabs on him for a number of years. There's a lot of these charismatic, uh, I wouldn't call them evangelical, but these are people who really have built a huge audience online. You said, is Robin Bullock real? I don't know about his hair, but the, <laughs> the preaching, the preaching, he's been doing it long enough that it doesn't just seem like an act. Yeah. But these people genuinely believe every miracle, that every miracle is real, that anything that floats into their mind must be God talking to them. And they have nothing holding them back from making predictions about politics because they know no one who actually watches them in good faith, unlike hello, um, they know no one's going to challenge them or go back and check their predictions, you know, that they made months uh, ago. The only reason you say that is because you're operating on the wrong, fre your frequency is not tuned. Your frequency <laughs> right. properly attuned. And that's why I haven't made a boat. Would, would, <laughs> one yeah. more real fast, just to get your reaction. Um, Sean McDowell, he's one of these sort of, um, I don't know, he looks like the typical Life Church youth group, past the right. hip pastor kind of dude. And yeah. he's got a website. He uh, recently went on TikTok. He wanted to give us a handy and helpful explanation as to why disasters and disease are actually a demonstration of God's love. Well, what about earthquakes? What about diseases? What about natural fires? What about all that stuff? Like, why would a loving father allow that to happen? Yeah, actually, God has given us those because he is good. We need earthquakes within our ecosystem to survive as human beings. Mm -hmm. Things like forest fires, we actually need forest fires to recycle some of the plants that are in different ecosystems. What about viruses? We actually need viruses. They help limit the amount of bacteria that spreads. And if we didn't have viruses, we wouldn't stop them. Now the Bible does say that the world was cursed. So somehow in the sin at Romans 3, it might have affected the magnitude of earthquakes. 
it might have affected the kind of viruses. I don't know that we know those particulars, but I do know that we actually need those very things to survive in our environment and flourish. So I think because God is loving, he's actually given us those things. Kind of a self-flagellation model there, you know. Uh, it's all good yeah. unless it's not good, but it's still good. And if it's a fallen <laughs> world, it's our fault. But uh, I mean, and if it's cow. bad, it's only bad through our limited viewpoints. And we don't know what God knows and all that. So, and here's the thing. His dad is Josh McDowell, who is a famous Christian apologist. Sean's followed in those footsteps as an apologist. So trying to explain all the things people would normally bring up as examples of why God doesn't exist. That is his whole jam right there. But I was actually surprised because I, I watch his TikTok videos and it's, I've I've been on stage with him for an event once. Like all these people are fine in person. But the thing that's surprising me about the clip you just played is that for someone who is a professional Christian apologist, that struck me as just a horrible answer for such a common question because it's it just downplayed how awful natural disasters and earthquakes and uh, giant sure. fires child could cancer be. you know if, if a child yeah. gets leukemia it's just more evidence that god loves us as the yeah overall and i'm lie. not saying all christians may not be able to give you a solid answer on like why would god allow kids to get brain cancer or something like that but you would expect a guy like mcdowell to have a really good firm strong tested answer that at least works for a crowd. And I watched that particular one and I'm like, I was taken aback by yeah. how bad of a justification that was. Well, it's frustrating too with the ever moving goalposts. You know, it's it's one of those things where God is demonstrated the proof of him is everywhere. Unless he yeah. is hidden, uh, he makes total sense <laughs> and lets his mysterious ways. God uh, has made sense of his intelligent design unless he is using right. the foolish things to confound the wise. Uh, you know, uh, God, it's a whole it's a whole religion based on heads I win, tails you lose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, God uses the horrible stuff to build our faith, or it's pain in this life, bliss in the next, or it's our fault, yeah. or it's an t attack of say. I mean, it's just unbelievable to watch them move the chess pieces around so that they can ultimately feel like they won the game. Uh, any final right. thoughts, uh, Hemet Meta, about what you're doing these days? I, I want to make sure we connect people with you and your work. <laughs> but I mean, beyond posting, yeah. you know, the clips of Robin Bullock and, and exposing the hate <laughs> preachers and and trying to make a more inclusive world, what are you up to these days, brother? You know, uh, I've been writing what I hope are more substantive posts at Only Sky, which that link is down there, um, which has been nice. It's not writing about every single idiot who happens to profess a religious belief and gets in the news. But it, I hope it's more substantive, more in-depth, and still the sort of thing I would hope a religious uh, person can read and say, I agree with everything you said. I mean, that's kind of the hope there. So I've been writing those articles. I am. If you're on YouTube right now, please go to the Friendly Atheist channel and subscribe. Just search for it. You'll find me there. I'm going through the Bible uh, chapter by chapter, and we're in... All of those sections that all those hate preachers love to cite right now. Um, and if you want to see those clips as I come across them, uh, I usually post them on Twitter because Twitter usually lets me do it and doesn't give me a Facebook ban. Well, I mean, that's so. a slog. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was going through and I've been working on a, a project on the Bible that's going to take years. But, you know, when you get into Leviticus. Oh, Oh, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just, it's it's like migraine-inducing, numbing slog through the Old Testament rules. Yeah. and Oh, my uh, God, dude. It's insane. Yes, you know. I agree. I need therapy now, <laughs> I think. I'll link everything uh, in the description box to make sure people can hook up with uh, you. And if you want to see, you know, the occasional wackadoodle clip, Make sure you have uh, subscribed and followed Hemet on Twitter, et cetera. Appreciate all the work you're doing. Thanks for having the conversation with me. I'm sure we'll cross paths again, okay? Of course. Thanks for everything you do, Seth.